welcome to South by Southwest. Um, I have been so amazed at the conversations around AI and technology, the thrills and the threat of it. But that's not what we're going to talk about in this hour. This talk is 100% about humanity. It's about your humanity. So I want you to sit back cozy in, and I want you to drop out of the future and come right here, right now, into the present. Because we're going to talk about you, your humanity, and the present, because that's what's going to inform the future. And it starts with this question. What do you want? I'm not asking you, what do you feel like? What are you in the mood for? What do you think you want? I'm not asking you, what do your parents want for you? What your partner is expecting? What your children need? I'm asking you in your heart of hearts, what do you want? What do you really, really want? Because I'm going to tell you my story today. I'm going to tell you why this matters. But I want you to let that question sink in and stir. This is the driving question of today's talk and the life brief. So my name is Bonnie Wan. I am a career brand strategist. In fact, I'm the head of strategy at Goodby Silverstein and Partners, a storied creative agency in San Francisco, California. And for the last three decades, I have worked with companies to help them get clear, crystal clear, on their essence, who they are, and what they want, so that they can innovate, create, and act from that place of distinction. Now with The Life Brief, I'm the author of a book called The Life Brief, A Playbook for No Regrets Living. I get to now do it for people. So I'm a brand strategist that has become a life strategist. And I get to do both in service of helping people write creative briefs for their lives. What is a creative brief? It is a tool used by almost every creative company and every creative strategist to help get crystal clear, drop into the essence of what a brand stands for, what a company stands for, and what you want so that you can act from that place of clarity. When it comes to life briefs, you can life brief any part of your life. And I have, I have a life brief for my marriage, my leadership, my parenting, even my relationship with money, which is one of the trickiest relationships I have in my life. It is a practice of distillation and declaration. Because what creative briefs do is they help us drop out of the noise, cut through the complexity, and get into the essence of what matters most so that everything we do comes from that place. Everything we say, everything we think, maybe not everything, but almost. And great creative briefs are what I call sharp, sticky, and action driving. Sharp because they're specific, they're evocative. Sticky because they're so memorable, they're tattooed on your minds and your hearts. And action driving because briefs don't mean a thing if they're left on the page. If they don't shape the choices you make and the actions you take. Why does any of this matter? Why is it important? Why now? Well, given all the conversations I've listened to, all the talks that I've attended, the panels. There's no surprise to anyone in this room 
that we're experiencing a moment of peak uncertainty. We know the causes. There's more than what's on the list here. We open our news apps and they're there. There they are. We open our social media apps and there it is. Last year alone, my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter, I have four kids, lost one of her friends to what we think might have been suicide. We came uncomfortably close to losing another friend to cancer well before his time. And I know too many people to count who are currently out of work or questioning whether to stay in their jobs. Here are some of the questions I hear when I go and teach or talk about the life brief. How do I navigate the unknown? Am I able to adapt? How do, av how do I avoid the burnout that I'm feeling right now? I'm so tired. I'm either languishing or I'm exhausted. Who can I count on? Who do I turn to? Who can I lean on? Who do I trust? Is there a way that I can do what I do and make a meaningful difference? These are some of the questions that I hear time and again. And ultimately, I think this is the question that restlessly hums underneath them all. Is the life I'm currently living the life I really, really want? So I'm going to ask you that question again. What do you want? What do you really, really want? That question has never been more important nor urgent. I was faced with my first set of unbearable questions in 2010. This is where I was in 2010, in Petaluma, California. And those were my three babies. I have four now, spoiler alert. My life looked perfect on paper. It looked really good on Facebook at the time. <laughs> We've moved on. <laughs> Um, but my career was skyrocketing, but coming at a cost to my family and myself. And I loved my job. But something was happening taking me to the verge. My marriage was dancing on the cliff's edge. I was the sole breadwinner. I was the 24-hour restaurant, the primary housekeeper, and yes, the cook. It wasn't that I was married to a bad guy. He was a good man, a really, really good man, and he still is. But I was bitter, I was frustrated, I was exhausted, and I had to face the big questions. And one day, a rainy April day, in the parking lot of the grocery store, I had to ask out loud for the first time, Am I with the right partner? Can I hold and handle this big life we've created together? And what if the answers to my questions are no? What happens then? Well, none of the answers came in the parking lot of the supermarket. But once spoken, they stirred. And they kept stirring. And they stayed with me until a night that I went home to my childhood home. I sat in my childhood bedroom. And I think that's when I hit bottom. And here's the story that was in my head that night. And it was the story that was I was carrying for weeks, if not months. My husband was the problem. My marriage was broken. It was cemented right here. 
But here's what I did in that dark moment. I had a reflex. I went to my reflex as a strategist, and I decided to write. Because as a strategist, my job is to collect the data. I need to take a look at the data before I make an assessment, before I act on my hunches. So I gave myself the freedom and the permission to be nakedly honest. And I, write, I wrote against that question, what do I want? What do I really, really want in my heart of hearts? Husband, parents, best friends, all their opinions aside. And what came out on the page was a revelation. Because after an hour of writing, what came out on the page was a different story altogether. It wasn't that my marriage was broken. It wasn't that my husband was the problem. Oh, where did we go? We went backwards. It was that my relationship with time was the problem. Everywhere on the page, in messy scrawls, in different expressions, was a longing for a different way to spend my time. I could see all the ways I was spreading myself thin and having nothing left to give at the end of the day. I was seeing all the ways I was saying yes to things I should have been saying no to. I don't know if any of you find this familiar, but that was a revelation that night. And as soon as I saw the new story, everything shifted. Suddenly, my attention shifted away from the terrifying path of, do we separate? How do we split this family up? To, my god, how do I reorganize my time? And as a strategist, my job is to keep going until I can peel back the layers and get to the heart of the question. And so this is what came out. Here's where I wanted to shift my time. I wanted more time with our kids and with each other. I didn't want to spend less time with my husband. I wanted to spend more meaningful time. And dare I say, as a woman, a mother, a breadwinner, that I wanted some time for myself. Yes, I dared. I wanted time to lean into the stuff that lights me up at work, that makes me feel most alive, that taps my creativity, and that allows me to lean into my job in not the way my predecessors had been doing it, but in the way that I could do it uniquely in my way. I wanted to expose my family to more than the little bubble of Northern California living. I wanted my kids to grow up seeing all the facets of humanity. And I knew that my hustle had taken over my health. And I wanted to reinvest my time, not just spend and spill it, but invest it in the thing that was going to give me the longevity to watch my family grow. And I wanted to participate in community because that's what gave us our lifeblood, our fuel. And without that, life just isn't as rich as it could be. And as a strategist, our job is to name it, write that strategy in a sharp and sticky way. And that first brief was called to take our time. Now, that, those three words meant a couple of things. It meant take back control over our time. Stop spilling it everywhere. Stop spending it. But it also meant to slow the fuck down. <laughs> two meetings, two very urgent and important meetings. And when I shared my brief, with my husband late that night, he immediately texted back, Y-E-S, all caps, triple exclamation marks. It was the first moment of alignment we had had in months, maybe a year, maybe over a year. 
And with that alignment came our first ray of hope that maybe we could take our lives in a different direction. But first we had to confront some real fears. Where is this brief gonna come? It was too urgent to wait for the next birthday, the next promotion, the next client, the next new business win, the next kid. We had to get it now. And we made ourselves two promises. We we're gonna hold each other in facing our biggest fears. One, that we would have to pick up our family and move. And two, that I would have to leave my job. Because again, I have a very tricky relationship with money or the lack of it. We found our brief only four months after writing it. It showed up in a community in Portland, Oregon. I started spending my time differently as soon as the brief came out. I started looking for schools. What are the schools, the communities, the neighborhoods that had the kind of values that we were looking for? My husband looked separately at homes. Where could we find the home that could fit our growing family? Both merged in a Portland, Oregon community. So we were living in Northern California. This showed up in Portland, Oregon. How the heck were we gonna do this? This was in 2010, way before hybrid work, remote work was a thing. We found the house on the corner, a block from the school, a block from the grocery store, a block from the coffee shop, pizzeria, everything. Everything we needed was only one block away. We got the house, we never toured it, but we knew that was the combination we needed. But then I had to have the hard conversation. And here's what I thought, there are only two options here. I can either stay at my job, stay in this life that maybe wasn't working, that was taking us down the wrong path, or I have to leave. Because life conditions us to believe there are only ever two answers, two choices, yes or no, this or that, stay or go. Here's what I found out. That's not true. Here's what I live every day in a creative agency. It is never true. You always have more answers than two. And I found out this day when I went in to quit my job, I gave my resignation, I said, I love this agency. It's been my home, my family, but I have to take my family to where our life needs to be, where we can have a different kind of relationship with time. So I have to leave. Without batting an eye, our president at that time said, what do you mean you have to quit? Why don't you do your job from Portland, Oregon? Let's experiment. And if it doesn't work, well, no, and you can quit then. What? I didn't even know that that choice was available to me. And guess what happens when companies make that kind of choice? My loyalty was tattooed in that moment. We moved our family to Portland, Oregon, and within four months of writing that brief, we went from our darkest chapter to our golden chapter. And this is what creative living is all about. When we allow ourselves to get very, very clear about what we need and we dare to act on it, doorways and gateways open up. That's my family today. Now, after 14 years, I have written dozens of life briefs. I've taught it across the country at companies like Google, Apple, Airbnb, and of course my agency, Goodby Silverstein Partners. I've taught it for Goop. I've taught it at South By three years in a row. And here's what I find time and again. When we have the courage to change our stories, we automatically watch change unfold in our lives. So I want to ask you, Whose story are you living? 
right now? Is it yours? Or is it a story that you've adopted or inherited? Whose story are you defending, excusing, passing down to maybe your children, your employees? Is it yours or someone else's? And what story are you listening to that might be holding you back, that might be causing you to hide parts of yourself, parts that are really sacred or non-negotiable? Maybe there's a story that is inviting you to play small when you can be so much more. What if I told you, you can rewrite the stories of your past. You can reframe them. And you can author your future. That is what we're here to do today. And it's hard to make time for. So we're going to make the space for it right here, right now, together. If you have a pen, or a paper, or notebook, or your phones even. I want you to write down anything that's coming up for you, especially when I ask you the question, what do you want? So over the years, the life brief has become my strategic advantage in life. It's been my compass through the chaos, because when you get really, really clear about what you want, it's hard to unsee it and choose otherwise. You'll know in your body when your briefs show up. You'll know when an invitation comes to you and it's the one that you need to choose. It's given me agency in the face of adversity and some of the darkest challenges during the pandemic. Parenting. Parenting in the pandemic was rough. And I don't know who has teenagers out there, but that was not the time to spend their high school years. And my son came very, very close to a really dark place. And it was our parenting brief that helped my husband and I align and pull him back into the safety of our family. Clarity helps you stand out from everyone else. That is a hard thing to do. We are always tempted to fit in, to belong, to follow the footsteps of the people we used to see or who came before us. But when we stand out and lean into our strengths, we discover a whole new way of being, of shepherding a new model for how to be. And this is something critical that came about for my leadership because I was the first woman to play my role in my agency after many, many years. And my first reflex was to do it just like it had been done before. But I knew that if I did that, I wouldn't create new paths for new people and more people like me to follow. <coughs> Clarity helps you pivot with purpose. You're always rooted in what matters most to you, and so you can flex, adapt, without losing sight of what matters most. And when you understand what makes you distinct, what makes you unique, you can flex with ease instead of hardship. And lastly, it helps you accelerate and bounce back. It's where you find your resilience. And this is proven in different studies that if you have clarity and your actions and your beliefs are aligned, it gives you a 30% boost in both motivation and resilience. What I've found over the years is that you can't have it all, but you can have all that matters. The real question is, do you know, are you clear about what matters most to you? It starts with throwing away our plans. In a world with hyper change, the more it's speeding up, the more we're kind of uh, 
we're navigating all the changes, technology, the eco economy. How do we navigate that? 70% of our strategic plans fail, according to Harvard Business Review. So this is a practice, a practice of tuning into who you are and what you want and using that as the compass as you navigate unpredictability. What it requires is your intuition, not your intellect. I like to say there is knowing and then there is knowledge. Sorry, there is knowledge and then there is knowing. <laughs> this is the place where you tune in, drop in, and that's where you navigate from. It is the difference between your essence and everyone else's story. So let's take a moment and drop into your quiet. Again, drop out of the future and into the now. And we're going to practice this very quickly. And if you have your notebook ready, I want you to write down anything that comes up and give yourself naked permission. Let whatever is inside to come out onto the page. It's a practice in three parts. The first part is getting messy. If we don't allow ourselves to get messy and drop in to what we want, to go to the places that scare us most, then we can't get clear. Our clarity will be muddled. Our clarity will be superficial or shallow. And once we have clarity, action flows right out of us because our attention shifts and we're able to point ourselves in the direction that we want to go. And getting messy starts with curiosity. We begin with questions. And here's the thing with strategy, life strategy or brand strategy. Finding the right questions, the good ones, the juicy ones, the penetrating ones, is harder than finding the answers. So don't jump to the practical. Start here and allow everything to bubble up from within. Set aside your inner critic, your inner judge, and your editor. Because the answers we seek lie behind the questions we avoid. And it's easier than ever to avoid those questions. In our 24-hour, always-on content world, we can distract ourselves endlessly, infinitely. So right now is your space. I'm going to toss up some questions. And anything that comes up for you, I want you to write it down on the page. Lean into the agitation. Because in creativity, this is where the good stuff is. Allow the agitation to be your fuel, to move you forward, to create the friction and the momentum you need to propel into what's next. So what does good mean to you? Think about a part of your life that is gripping you right now. Is it a relationship? Is it your work? Is it your relationship to yourself? Is it a cause or a community that means so much to you? Let's talk about what does it mean to be a good partner? What does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to do good work? It all starts with how we define the context that is ours, not the definitions of those around us. What lights you up? What are you devoted to? I mean, really devoted to comes to mind when you don't even have to think about it. What would, you, what would change in your life if you leaned harder, leaned deeper, leaned more fully into those parts? What's holding you back right now? Where do you find resistance? What are you resisting? 
What might change for you if you let that resistance go? Where or what are you hiding? And what might change if you stopped hiding? What could be different? What might shift? This is my favorite set. What is sacred or non-negotiable? What's worth fighting for? And what are you willing to risk, trade, or even sacrifice to make it happen? One of my favorite exercises is to write your own eulogy. What would you like people to say about you at the end of your life? What would, they like, what would you like them to point to? What would you like them to remember? And when you look at those against your resume values, the resume values are what you want today. What is the agitation between them. How can your eulogy values inform how you want to show up in the here and now? How do you take those values and bring it all the way back? Write it all down. Because here's what happens when we capture it. Writing rearranges the furniture of our minds. What that means is, it jostles it up. It also parks it on the page so that we can be in relationship with it. We can create distance between what we want and our emotions. We can turn to it and look at it with a beginner's mind and the curiosity. And we create space for new stories and new ideas to emerge. So collect it in your writing. Stir on the questions. Put it on the page. Allow yourself the practice of permission and naked honesty. And once you have that, then we can work on the art of distillation, which is clarity. This is where we get to look for patterns, ahas, and insights. What are we seeing that we weren't able to see before? Just like back in 2010, I thought that my marriage was broken. I thought that my husband was the problem. But what was really broken was my relationship with time. And once I saw that, and I could see the patterns, once I had the insight, I could see the patterns, and then I can change the behavior. So step back and note what you've generated, and start to see where you can reframe the stories that you've been holding, that you've been repeating in your mind, again and again. And then we get to sort everything from what is sacred and non-negotiable, our must-haves, to our nice-to-haves, to what we can do without. And the must-haves are the things we keep and we take everything else out and discard. Because the must-haves are where the juice is. That's where your life brief begins. And then we get to draft. And what we're looking for are declarative statements, declarations about what you want, sentences that you would end with an exclamation, even if you don't like exclamations. But what you're looking for is for your body to tell you the story, not your mind. It is about feeling it, and what I call a fuck yes feeling. So here are some, this is the brief that my husband and I wrote during the pandemic when our son was slipping. We didn't know. We were so busy tending to our youngest ones 
that we lost track, we, we couldn't see. We just thought the older kids were handling it. They were independent. They knew what to do. And little did we know that he was slipping. It got to a point where we were really scared. We didn't know how to handle the behavior that was coming out. We couldn't read the signs. And my husband and I were on two different pages about how to parent. We weren't aligned. And in the darkest hour, I said to my husband, let's write, let's write a new brief. I took the time and wrote one. He took a weekend, went to the coffee shop, and wrote his own. As soon as I saw his, I threw mine out. And here's what it was. We wanted to parent more consciously. We weren't seeing him. It was clear. And we wanted to honor who he was, not what we wanted him to be. And we needed to show him and demonstrate that we could see who he was becoming. We needed to give him space to use his voice. We were lecturing, lecturing, lecturing. We needed to create the space to hear his perspective and acknowledge that his views were valid. We wanted to share more intimacy, some real intimacy with him, not just talk at him. And we needed to focus on the long game, not the immediate achievements, the immediate metrics or measures. We wanted to challenge him to go to his edge without going over it. And most importantly, we needed to hold him accountable to what was happening in the moment and to demonstrate to him that that's what real love looks like, not permissive parenting, because that means that we don't care. But real love looks like accountability. It means holding you up, telling the truth, and honoring yours. This is a brief of a good friend of mine. She was ready to step up into a next level of her career, to actually claim her full worth, to finally graduate from student to master, and to learn as much from her clients as they could learn from her. And she was ready to scale her business and create lasting wholesale change. That was her mission. And have the world finally recognize her name. Now, this was really hard for her because her entire life was playing small. She didn't feel that she had the courage to claim what, was her, what she had earned to step into the story that she was ready to step into now. As a leader, this is something that I stepped into during the 2020 pandemic. How do we create wholesale change with equity at the center? I was ready to speak my truth, no matter how uncomfortable it got, to ask really tough questions, to name the inequities, and to start taking accountability and owning the problems to create space for new voices to be heard. And this meant speaking less, listening more. And as Margaret Johnson, our chief creative officer says, to lift as we rise. Once you have your draft of your brief, you push it. This is what strategists do. You make it bolder, you take it deeper, you make it sharper until you get to that fuck yes feeling. Because as a strategist, you can't inspire creatives, product designers, innovators, if you can't get them to the most inspirational place. They'll walk right out of the room. And what that means is they need to feel it. It needs to evoke ideas. It needs to be a springboard to action. So five bold declarations and one sharp sticky name. Here are past briefs over the last 14 years. Take our time, do big work, 
put our health over our hustle. This is my wealth brief, to be rich in relationship. If we could only be rich in one way, what would that be? And then my leadership brief, how do we change the game? Here's the good thing about life briefs. You don't have to speak to anybody. There's no creatives involved. There's no room full of people. All they have to do is speak to you and to give you that feeling. And here's the beauty of clarity. Action is a byproduct to clarity. It's easy to act when you know where you want to go. In fact, it automatically shifts your attention and creates new momentum. The choices become easier. The actions start to flow out of you. But it's the small actions that are the most meaningful ones. This is not about quit your job, get a divorce, put your pets up for adoption. This is about the tiniest but continuous action, the smallest actions you can take. And when the doubt creeps in, break it down. Don't build it up. Make it irresistible, inexcusable, unignorable. That's what tiny does. And as we say in the agency, lead with ideas. Chase the things that give you goosebumps. Listen to your body. Drop into your intuition. It's in your knowing that you find your direction. And your life brief evolves as you evolve, because this is not a static thing. When you check in with it, if it calls to you, if there's something new, if there's change, follow it. And as always, write it down. You probably know this data point already. But Bronnie Ware, palliative nurse, studied the top five regrets people have at the end of their lives. This is the number one most common one. I wish I'd had the courage to a, live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. We can start living these lives right now. And it starts with the clarity and the dropping in to our essence, the essence of what we really want. Because life is brief. We've learned that over the last few years. But you can live it with meaning, and you can make it yours. And it starts with unlocking the clarity that is inside you. Are there any questions? Yes. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm the leader of a small team, small team firm. And I would want to understand how do I help my employees right now? Thank you. Oh, such a good question. So I work, I have a lot of work teams who do this together. And it starts, here's what's great great leaders invite that, this kind of honesty and clarity into their teams and from their employees. And what that means is, is opening themselves up to the question of what do they want. I think the performance review is dead, right? It leaves people <laughs> deflated. You get all this feedback. People jump right straight to what are the growth areas, and then they're deflated about where do they want to go from there. Doing the life brief or doing a work brief helps people really take that feedback and channel it into a really sharp and visionary way. How do we bring imagination? How do we turn that, use that feedback as clay that we can mold into something sharp, inspiring, and directing? 
But it does start with allowing people to open up about where are they hiding, what's holding them back. And as leaders, sitting, listening, reflecting on those answers and creating the conditions for them to lean harder and deeper into their strengths, into what makes them distinct, while at the same time fulfilling the expectations of the role. And that's where the company's purpose and the individual's purpose intersect. Thank you for that question. Yes? We do it separately, and then we come together. And here's what I found is I, there are people who do it with their families, um, a, a woman with their niece and nephew, and work teams. We have friend groups. We have C-suites. It's really interesting from a leadership level. But I invite everyone to do theirs first and then come together. And you don't have to take it all the way to the brief, but it's really important to get down to your voice, your story, your values, your beliefs before you share. But what's wonderful, the outcome that no one expects or predicts is that before even getting to that clear fuck yes brief, people come closer together. You start to see each other in new light and it deepens your understanding and for work teams in particular, it creates trust breeds the trust between the team. And there's a Google study pre-pandemic that looked at what are the patterns, the driving patterns for high-performing teams. They couldn't find any patterns in terms of who was on the team. The who didn't matter at all. They had all-star teams, senior teams, junior teams, a mix. The number one driver of high performance was trust. And so when we do this, when we allow ourselves to answer the questions, allow ourselves to, allow, to be nakedly honest with each other, then we deepen that trust and we deepen those relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's why I call it a practice, right? It's not a one and done thing. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And the more you capture it in writing, the more it's going to speak back to you and you're gonna know what's honest. You're gonna know what's a mood of the moment, a feeling, passing feeling, and what are the patterns. And those patterns are what are true. That's where the truth lies. Um, I have a lot of people who tell me, I don't know what I want. I have no idea what I want. But after 14 days of writing it down, it becomes so clear, I very much do know what I want. And so the truth emerges over time, and not a long time. This practice isn't about quantity of time. It's about the quality of your engagement and your presence. And when you read it back to you, that's what it means to be in relationship with yourself. When you read it back to yourself, you will have a feeling your body will know. Yes, that feels true. Or no, I'm holding back still. And the more you write, the more you leave the audience behind. You stop writing for the reader and you start really unlocking yourself. Yes. Well, I had to write a book to teach my children. <laughs> um, it, it's funny, I have therapist friends who say, oh my, I, I think your, your children must be so well adjusted. And they say, are you kidding? I'm a parent too. Um, so I teach a lot of other people's children. So I just taught at the University of Oregon and I teach a lot of seniors in high schools. But my children, I'm waiting for them to write the book. But I do think, that, joking aside, 
they are very in tune because we often talk, the language we speak in our house is, what is your knowing telling you? Go to your knowing place. And so that constant invitation is what has them doing the practice without us actually having to teach the practice. No more lecturing, more invitation and modeling. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna try answering this and you tell me if I'm effective at it. So the question is, is how do you know if your brief is aligning with the people around you? A lot of times people ask me, can I life brief my boss? Can I life brief my child, my partner? And the thing is, is that when we get clear about what we want and we start showing up and shifting what we say, what we do, it starts to become an invitation for everyone else to respond and react differently. But what happens when you are in partnership with someone and your briefs don't align? I usually invite people to level it up. Can you take it even higher? Because often we start low, tactical. What do we want to change? What do we want to see in our immediate lives right now? As we start to look further out to the horizon, what do, you, what do we define as a good life? What does it mean to you? Often what I find is instead of friction, you start to find inspiration as you share those things together and start to unpack them. And if they are ultimately misaligned, then there's another good signal for what to do next. Holly. Would you be willing to share a little bit of, the, like, of what you estimate as your financial story? Yes, so my financial story, my relationship with money, it started very young, as many of our stories do. It started with my parents who immigrated here when I was six years old from Taipei, Taiwan. And my dad went from a highly esteemed family name and history to becoming one of a million Asian Chinese immigrants. This really cost him from his identity, his sense of self-worth. He became depressed, alcoholic. He was laid off of job after job. And what I viewed was a trade-off, a massive trade-off, because how he measured his self-worth was in the form of dollars, his financial success, his financial abundance. And he became so depressed at the end of the day that his mother, who was his idol, um, he loved his mom, my grandmother, so much but he couldn't face her, and he never returned to see her for the last 25 years of her life. He only returned to Taiwan after she had passed because she, he, he couldn't face her. So very young in my life, I had forged a feeling and a story in myself that wanting financial abundance would come at a severe cost to my own health, to my family's health. And it's taken me many iterations of the life brief to break that and to flip that. And what I like to say, reframe that. And reframing means I've had to write time and again a new story, which is when I ask for my worth financially, it is not a trade-off. It is not selfish. It is actually a path to self-reliance. It is a path to self-worth. And so these are the stories that we are often embedded with, tattooed in our hearts, that we have an opportunity to name first, first see, then name, and then rewrite. And that is really the power of leaning into the agitation that I'm talking about. 
There were some other hands. Yes. Yes. So I am headed over to the South by Southwest bookstore. I'm doing a book signing in um, at 515 there. My book really breaks these three thing, three uh, three ways, three parts of the practice down into very specific bite size, irresistibly inexcusable chunks. So if there's any nervousness about wading into these questions, the book will make it dead simple, inexcusable. And I've designed it so that you can do it in not a lot of time. It won't take the time, but it does require the engagement. And then it has stories in there to help you see and again, inspire what are the stories in your life? How do you tell? What is truth? What is feeling? What is someone else's story? So it walks you through the entire practice. Yes, back there. What would you want to be more readable or more Yeah. This is, this is a great question. And one of my favorite ones. I call this creative living and courageous living. Because the act of courage in this is just the allowance for you to be nakedly honest with yourself. For me to be able to declare what I want without the certainty of attaining it. That's where the courage lives. And what I have found time again and again is that it's not the act of getting what I want that gives me what I call this soul satisfying feeling, it's, it lies in just knowing that I'm going for it. Because the regret doesn't come from not getting it. The regret comes from not going for it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is, what happens when we name our limiting beliefs and we see that they are playing out again and again? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, so part of it is, can you reimagine a new way to be with them? First of all, radically accepting and acknowledging. Acknowledging is accepting. It's just embracing that this is who you are. You don't have to reject it. You don't have to deny it. The next step is, can you reimagine what you would want it to become? Where do you want to shift it? Is it holding you back? Is it creating some other kind of friction in your life? And how can you reimagine it? And reimagining it and then acting on it starts in really small ways that requires your own grace and your own forgiveness because none of us do it perfectly. And I meet my patterns and my limiting beliefs about money time and again with each chapter. So they don't go away forever, but I know how to work with it. I notice it when it comes up, and I've started to practice other stories to put around it. So when I give talks now, that story comes up and again. And I found some methods to overcome asking. I say it way up front before I even get to that point. Or I come back with a different way of framing it, why it's worth it. I also have not, I, I no longer have a problem saying no, maybe next time. And so I think it's li the change lies in the small ways that we can practice and still be forgiving when we don't get it right. 
But when I write it down, it helps me remember and I can go back to it time and again. And in fact, I have some stickies up on my wall right now reminding me of that money brief. And they also know that at the, at the end of the day, what really is meaningful to me is to be rich in relationship. And the money is in service of something much bigger. And so I think when we name our beliefs, let's understand what role they play. Where do they hold us back? And where do we want them to propel us forward? Yeah, thank you. OK, thank you so much for coming. Thank yourselves for being here. I'll be at the bookstore in just a bit. And you can come by and pick up a book. Thank you. Mm -hmm.